Hey, welcome to the Tales of a Gearhead podcast. This is brought to you by Cornwell Tools. They're the choice of professionals since 1919. Can you believe that? 1919. It's over 100 years building tools. All right, let's get rolling. Well, we had a really great experience last week. We were out on the road, myself and Jonathan and Mark, the crew guys that we work with. You guys have both seen them on the show from time to time, helping carry bumpers or helping out with things and making the show happen. We all went out to Kanab, Utah, and we shot a story on Tom Daniel. For those of you guys that don't know who Tom Daniel is, where have you been? <laughs> Now, there's a lot of people that don't realize the name behind the work. Now, Tom Daniel, for those of you that don't know, he's the guy that drew all those great cars and for those models in uh, back in the 60s and 70s. We're talking about the Red Baron. We're talking about the Paddy Wagon, the Ice T, Bad Medicine, Bad News, all of these, you know, the Tijuana Taxi, the Cherry Bomb. I think there's over 80 of his designs that actually became models. You know, one of the reasons we're doing a story on him, I think he's probably the most influential designer of all time. Now, that's a huge thing to say because to me, that even puts him ahead of like guys like Harley Earl and some of these, you know, Harry Bentley Bradley and some of these great automotive designers. But Tom, you know, not only worked, you know, for GM in the late 50s for a short stint, but his work drawing these crazy vehicles that became models has influenced so many car guys over the years that that's why I call him the most influential. And the cool thing about Tom, you know, is that he didn't just draw the pictures of the vehicles from the outside. He designed a whole chassis and everything. And the unique thing about Tom is that he's not a car builder, never built one in his life. That is really interesting, the way that he was able to do that. And so we're digging into that in the story that will be coming out this season on the show. Another thing that a lot of people don't realize about Tom, it wasn't just automotive art that he did. He's also into trains like crazy. We walk in there and these electric trains are all over the place. Super detailed, you know, just amazing stuff. And then his fine art, you know, his landscapes and his people and his things of trains and stuff, it's just astounding. So, you know, he's every bit that kind of crazy artist that you'd see, you know, and he's just a great guy. We had a great time. Uh, spend the time with Tom, and I really look forward to bringing this story to you guys. So keep an eye out for that. And in the meantime, we'd love to hear what your favorite Tom Daniel car was. That is a really fun question to ask people because you never know, but everybody has one or two favorite Tom Daniel designs. So we'd like to hear what those are. Okay, I'm sitting here looking at an article that is about North Carolina, and they are... Uh, passing a law that is going to make it illegal to do what we call the Carolina squat with your truck. Now, <laughs> if you don't know what that is, you guys have seen these trucks that are running down the road that are squatting in the rear. I'm talking about a pickup that looks like it has a thousand pounds of weight across the rear axle, so it's squatting in the rear. And, you know, it doesn't matter if you think that looks cool or if you don't. The problem with this is that they're making it a law that you can't do it. <laughs> you know, now I know a lot of you guys are out there is like, yeah, I should not make that a law. That's really stupid. And listen, guys, I get that. But the thing is, think back when you were a car guy when you were young and some of the stupid stuff you did with cars. You know, some of them were good and some of them weren't so good. And that's kind of the learning part of a car. And it's also the personal aspect of a car. You know, I'm not saying that I like that look at all. You guys know me enough. I'm a truck guy. I don't really like that look. I do strongly support the freedom for guys to be able to do that. Because once we start to dictate taste, once we start to dictate personal preferences, that's a really slippery slope that we don't want to go down in the automotive world. Remember, it was just a few years ago that states were trying to pass exhaust laws to where you could put on Flowmaster mufflers or any muffler that had a little bit louder sound. Now listen, if something is dangerous, and there is some questions about some of this Carolina Squat stuff, if it makes the vehicle handle badly, well, that's a different issue. You know, anytime you do something that 
makes it unsafe for other people on the road, like a heavily lifted vehicle. I mean, you start going over six, you know, eight inches, 12 inches in the air with massive tires, there starts to be a safety issue for other people on the road. Not only you losing control of the vehicle, but you know, running over somebody. So I can see that if it's a safety issue is one thing. But if it's just a stylistic thing that it just kind of annoys people, well, <laughs> that's kind of what car guys do. You know, and we've all done that in some way. If you got big loud pipes, you got a blower sticking out of the hood and you can't see out of the front, you know, you're doing that for a reason. So it's important that we don't regulate something and have it come back and bite us on the butt, which this very well could. Because what's to stop somebody from going, you know, I've never really liked, you know, the blackout grills or the windows or this or that. And they start passing legislation and it starts to become to where we can't modify our vehicles at all. They call it the anti-squat law, <laughs> which brings up a whole different issue for me. So you can't modify it more than three inches in the front and two inches in the rear. That doesn't give you a whole lot of movement there. Now, you know, one of the things that's really important to realize is like, if you look back at the old 50s cars, like the old 50s Mercs, you know, the lead sleds that everybody loves. Well, George Barris said that they used to put bricks in the back of those cars to make them sag in the rear, or they'd heat the springs and drop them down on the ground. Because those cars, if you look at them, they sag in the rear. They were not level. They, they were butt draggers. And that is like a classic hot rod look. So I always kind of look at this, you know, people talking about the Carolina squat trucks, you know, and it's like, well, really, that's kind of a, a modern version of the old Mercs. Now, <laughs> I don't think it belongs on a truck, but you got to be careful, guys. You got to keep your eyes open here for legislation and stuff that somehow could limit you from being able to modify your vehicle because that takes the fun out of it. So if you're into the Carolina squat look, <laughs> you better find something else, especially if you're in North Carolina. My question is, if it's three inches in the front and two inches in the back, does that mean that you can no longer put like a four or a six inch lift kit on the vehicle at all? It gets even worse than that. Say you do a two inch lift and you upsize your tire by, you know, four inches. Well, that's added lift as well. It's very easily possible to put on a three inch lift and a bigger tire and go over the limit. It's going to take a policeman that's going to get out with a ruler and go, okay, stock height, and they measure your bumper height. You know, if you really have caused some problems, they'll get out and do that. But here's another thing. Some states measure from the top of the bumper. Some states measure from the bottom of the bumper. Some states measure from headlight height. You know, they're not all the same. So you literally could drive your vehicle, put on a four inch lift and a couple sizes bigger tire, drive across state lines and get pulled over and a guy say, your truck's illegal. You know, so yeah, it's, it becomes a real dicey thing. All right, I've got a question for you guys. What is the most important tool in your garage. All right, I know you're thinking. I know you're thinking. Come on. Give me, yeah, all right. All right, well, it's probably the one you use the most. And that would be your sockets, your ratchets, your screwdrivers, and your wrenches. And if you want quality tools there, you probably ought to check out somebody like Cornwell. Now, granted, you can get some cheaper tools. And honestly, there's a place for those, those ones that you want to bend up and heat and go into certain places and those screwdrivers you don't mind screwing up <laughs> well that's where you get the cheap stuff but if you want real quality tools that are going to last and have a warranty that's where you need to check out somebody like cornwell they've been doing it forever and believe me you do get what you pay for All right, let me share a little story about what happened the other day. I was talking to a, a lady at one of the restaurants that she had come up and her son was interested in cars. And she was like, you know, what is the real benefit of working on these cars and learning about this stuff? She says, is it just to mess around and spend money and waste time? And I thought that was kind of sad because that's the concept that a lot of people have of car people. We have to do better at changing that. <laughs> Some of these reality shows that are out there don't really do us much good as an industry. But anyway, back to her. She was kind of wondering, you know, what's the benefit? And I told her, I said, listen, if your son or daughter 
can get out there and learn some things about an automobile, the workings of them, those are things that it will prepare you for challenges of life. You know, because obviously on a vehicle, you know, it's nice, but there's there's other ways to be able to problem solve, you know, if you're working on the house or if you're, you know, in a situation and, and knowing how mechanical things work, our whole world is surrounded by mechanical things. How a door latch operates, you know, is something that you can learn off of a car. You know, it, it helps you in solving problems and getting out of situations. Say if they're in a wreck, they can't get out of the vehicle, the doors are locked shut or jammed shut. You know, how to break out a window, how to know what to do, you know, that kind of thing. For example, I was driving down the road the other day. I was in in the van that I've got (laughs) and I'll need to fill you in on this van. Years ago, I had this little cargo van. It was like an 83 six-cylinder shorty G10 Chevy cargo van and I love this thing because it was just a great shop truck and it was what we called the pervert van you know it had no windows <laughs> it was just one of those little shorty vans and the moment I got rid of it I regretted it and so I've always been looking for another one so I found this one just recently and brought it home and Catherine was like are you kidding me you brought a van home <laughs> and I said you're gonna love this van And within just a couple of weeks, you know, we were loading furniture in it and all this stuff. She's kind of like, wow, you know, I kind of like that van. And then with a few days after that, she's like, hey, why don't you grab that van and go pick up some stuff? So anyway, they're really, really useful. This particular van is a three speed on the column, as we called back in the day, the three on the tree, which is very well worn. There's about 90,000 miles on this thing. So the linkage is all loose and that's a challenge to drive. So anyway, I'm heading down the road to pick up some stuff. And all of a sudden the clutch pedal just goes to the floor and it's just flapping around. You know, I can't shift. And, you know, I pull it out of gear and I can't get it into gear. So I managed to roll off. I get a a green light. I get off the road, get into a parking lot. And I roll to a stop right by a homeless encampment. (laughs) And they see this big yellow van rolling in and they're like, this is awesome. It's a miracle. (laughs) I think they thought I was going to donate it to them or something. They're like, we're going to live in that van. And I'm like, "Uh, no, you're not. So I didn't dare leave it there though. I was, (laughs) I get on the phone and I called in, had a buddy of mine bring a trailer over to pick it up. I crawled up underneath it and I could tell immediately because, you know, worked on a ton of vehicles over the years in just a few seconds i could tell kind of where the problem was and if i could fix it right there or not and it was not something that i could fix right there you know called a trailer had it come out and i didn't end up leaving my van because i guarantee you if i'd have gotten out of that thing come back an hour later those people would have been camping in there man and (laughs) i would have lost my van forever but anyway you know obviously if you're driving something old and beat up you're going to run into that kind of stuff. So you want to have that skill to be able to do these kind of things. But also, you want to be able, you never know when that's going to be something that that you'll be able to help somebody with. I can't tell you how many people have tried to help like hook up a trailer or strap down a load on a trailer that have no idea what they're doing and they, they mean well. But man, there's that's why you see crap along the road all the time and all kinds of fails on the internet of people that have lost things because they don't really know. And it's it's basic, you know, kind of physics on strapping things down. But if somebody hasn't been taught, it can be a really dangerous situation. And I know that because I've lost things out of the back of the vehicles before myself. It's important to kind of understand these things and understand the workings of a mechanical vehicle. The thing that I always tell people that question it, think, well, it's just kind of a a hot rodder thing and you guys are just, you know, trying to show off and do that kind of thing. And sure, there's people that do that. But the real car person, they just love the mechanical aspect of stuff and they want to understand it and they want to be able to, you know, utilize it and make it work for them. And like I said, our whole world is, we're surrounded by mechanical things all the time. So why would you not want to understand it? and be able to at least utilize it for your benefit. Because if you don't, you have to call somebody and pay them that does. And that can get real expensive. Anyway, learn to work on things, learn the the way things operate, and you'll be much better off. 
All right. You know, one of the things that happens in every guy's life that nobody likes to talk about is every once in a while, you have to go in and have a physical. Yeah. And now every guy that's listening to this is like, oh, boy. Uh, I know what that's all about. Drop your shorts and bend over, Mr. Babar. We don't want to do that. You know, if I did some sit-ups in the morning or bent over like this, I'd probably feel 100% but Moon River. Whew. Thank you, Doc. You ever serve time? And every girl that's listening is like, uh-huh, I know what that's all about. Because whether you're male or female, you got to have a physical. And they're not pleasant on either side. Now, I've heard the arguments. You know, keep in mind, there's, there's three girls in our house. So... I hear the other side. It's like, well, we have it so bad, you know, we get this and this and this. And listen, I'm with you. It does not sound pleasant. But (laughs) the physical for guys is not pleasant at all either. (laughs) I'm sure everybody can relate to that. And Jonathan, I guess that you're going in for the big physical tomorrow, huh? I have the first physical in probably been six years. Six Uh, years. uh, I'm a little bit overdue. Yeah. So that's going to be the full Monty there, isn't it? I, I think so. And um, <laughs> what, what's great is they always ask you if, if there's a history of anything because that opens up the door for more testing. Yeah. My dad had his prostate removed probably 10 years ago. So uh, oh technically there's a history of that. I'm not super excited to share all that information. <laughs> Just also a new doctor. So there's always going to be like, well, we have no records on you here. So uh, let's just start from the very beginning and do all of them. Oh, yes. Yeah, I had to go through that one time, man. And then I try to keep the same doctor. But <laughs> Do you remember getting physicals as a kid? They were super easy back then. When you're like six or seven or 10 or 12, getting a physical for like, you know, playing basketball or yeah. school. Yeah. Super simple. My parents, you know, we didn't have a lot of money. So my parents were always trying to save money. And so they took us down to the clinic, me and my older brother one time. And they said, we're saving money. It is a public physical. And so (laughs) we go in there and there's all these guys standing around. And they aged from like age like seven to like you had to be in high school still. So it was high school age from like seven to high school age. And so we walk into this kind of gymnasium and they're like, okay, everybody strip down to your shorts. Okay, so now we're all standing there in our underwear, which is awkward enough, at, especially at that age. I think I was probably 10 or 11. And so we go in and the nurses are taking all of our blood and everything. And, and they're all female. And it's kind of like, uh... So is it going to be all women doctors, like all the way through? (laughs) And, you know, to a kid, that's traumatic. And it was funny. I remember asking a guy, you know, I was like, man, I I can't imagine having a a woman doctor, you know, doing the big examination. And he's like, well, so you'd rather have a guy do it? (laughs) And I'm like, well, you know, honestly, I'd rather have neither, you know. It's it's like, I don't know how to answer that. (laughs) <laughs> anyway, so we're standing there. You know, we go into the next room and they're doing the turn your head and cough thing right there in front of everybody. It's seriously, it's like being in the army from what I understand. We get through that and then you have to go into the the bathroom and take a urine sample. And everybody's standing around. And I don't know about you, but you know, most guys get what we call stage fright. You know, with a bunch of guys around, you just can't pee. And the reason being, I know for me, the, the junior high that I went to was really rough. There were no doors on the stalls, so guys would wait until you got in there and were peeing, and they'd come in and kick you in, in the back. And what that would do was push you forward, and of course you'd spray down the wall and half on your clothes, and they'd run out laughing, that kind of thing. So yeah, I never pee around anybody like that, and especially... If there's guys around going to play practical jokes. So getting a sample is not easy. And then we all had our little paper cup and we're standing there, you know, in line to give this. And there was this staircase. There was like four stairs. And I'm like three steps down and my older brother is standing right behind me on the stairs. And everybody's jostling and pushing around. I feel this liquid go down my back. Now keep in mind, I'm in my underwear. So it's my bare back and it starts right you know, just under my neck, and I feel it roll and trickle all the way down to my underwear. And there was two things that struck me. First of all, this is pee. Second of all, it's like this is ice cold. And I'm standing there, and I'm just fuming, and I turn around, and there's my brother behind me, and he's got this little smirk on his face. And it's kind of this little chuckle. And so I ask him, 
the one thing that a, a teenage kid can ask, I'm like, what was that? <laughs> and he's kind of laughing. He goes, uh, it's pee. <laughs> So I'm like beside myself standing here. And then he's like, I'm sorry, man. I didn't mean to do that. He says, but don't worry. It wasn't mine. I'm like, what, what, do you, what does that mean? Well, he had gotten in there and gotten stage fright and couldn't go to the bathroom. So he just scooped some up out of the bottom of the urinal. So this is supposed to make me feel better. <laughs> so, so anyway, we get done with that. I, I can't imagine what his sample came back looking like. But I did not have another full physical for probably 20 years after that. <laughs> not a pleasant experience. Oh my gosh. It was something, man. To this day, my brother still laughs about that. Oh, oh that was awful. You couldn't do something like that nowadays. We'd all be in jail. <laughs> Jeez. All right, that's it for today. Once again, we're brought to you by Cornwell Tools. Have a great day and get out there and work on something. <laughs>